Christine Granville was one of the most effective special agents to serve Britain during World War II. She was also Winston Churchill's favorite spy. In World War II, they supported the intelligence services. War effort in the clandestine war would not have been as successful without the contributions of women. World War II, one of the bloodiest conflicts in human history, characterized by heavy fighting and echoes of big guns and big bombs. But beyond the front lines and the bloody battlefields, there were several individuals who toiled day and night in a thankless effort to acquire sensitive intelligence, sabotage enemy troops, and ultimately bring the enemies to their knees. These female spies, who risked life and limb to venture into enemy territories, represent a part of history which is often overlooked. Today, we pay homage to these unsung heroes as we explore the history and fate of World War II captured female soldiers. The Brief History of World War II Espionage Are you ready for stories stranger than fiction and accounts of extraordinary heroes that seem straight out of a 007 movies? Then stick with us as we take a trip down memory lane into the history of espionage during one of the most brutal conflicts in history. World War II Espionage is a double-edged sword. While the administration that benefits from the critical information acquired by the shadowy figures celebrates them as heroes, people on the other side of the spectrum, who are often oblivious to the existence of these dark nights, find themselves scratching their heads, wondering where things went wrong. In the world of spies, there are no heroes and there are no villains. Everyone is simply a player in this game of chess. During World War II, spying played a huge role in the dynamics of the war and its eventual outcome. Every major player in the war dipped their hands in the mud, employing clever and crafty men and women who hide in plain sight, infiltrate enemy lines, and sabotage their intelligence. Britain, Germany, the Soviet Union, and even the United States of America all understood the importance of information and intelligence in their military operations across Europe, North Africa, and Southeast Asia. Spies were the unsung heroes of the war, and their contributions ultimately altered the course of the war. These brave men and women risked life and limb for an uncelebrated glory, knowing fully well the fate that awaited them upon capture. Some of them were able to escape unscathed, but many fell to the wits of the enemies, and with their cover blown, these spies faced inhumane treatment by the enemies, severe punishments, interrogations, and torture. Sometimes they even end up paying the ultimate sacrifice, so espionage in the Second World War was a high calling, reserved for the best of the best. Being a spy in World War II was no mean feat. This daring endeavor required serious grit, extreme calmness, and an ability to sell a lie. Some spies even go as far as functioning as double agents, working for two governments at the same time, while some even kick it up a notch, serving the interest of three different governments and agencies while functioning as triple agents. Spy recruits often came from various classes and backgrounds, from Indian royals like Noor Inayat Khan to members of the working class and even convicted criminals like the infamous Eddie Chapman, known as Agent Zigzag. Eddie had served several prison sentences for several crimes, ranging from petty theft to safe-cracking. Before he was recruited to work for Nazi Germany, before turning double agent for the British. During World War II, working as a spy meant living a double life, projecting a false image, which might even require a false identity, and in some extreme cases, alterations to the physical features like the face, in order to appear as a completely different person. The ability to blend in, hide in plain sight, and ultimately avoid detection made the spies of World War II exemplary figures. But these weren't just simple men and women working alone. Espionage in World War II was a web, spun and controlled by dedicated organizations unique to each home country. Are you excited to find out more? Pay attention as we examine some of these secret organizations established by the key players of World War II in order to obtain crucial intelligence that altered the course of the war. Britain's Special Operations Executive. You've probably heard of the SOE, 
the infamous secret organization set up by Winston Churchill with a mission to set Europe ablaze. Formed in 1940, this voluntary group of secret agents was mainly tasked with sabotage and subversion behind enemy lines. Under the command of Brigadier Colin Gubbins, the Special Operations Executive became one of the most feared forces during the Second World War. Many SEO agents were serving soldiers, who had displayed exceptional skills that singled them out for these special assignments. Others joined directly from civilian lives in a bid to serve their countries during such tumultuous times. After undergoing grueling training that instilled in them the rudiments of espionage and trained them in the handling of advanced spying equipment and basic fighting skills in the event that they may need to defend themselves, these brave men and women were sent into enemy territories as ordinary everyday humans. This is where things get interesting. In order to infiltrate enemy-occupied regions, female spies were enlisted in the First Aid Nursing Yeomanry, a quasi-military force, which served as a first aid link between frontline fighting and field hospitals. This was a cover for their real mission in the conflict regions. Other SEO operatives were often parachuted into these enemy territories, armed with clandestine radio transmitters, which were disguised to look like ordinary suitcases. SEO agents were also armed with several cool gadgets, including specially designed explosives, silenced guns, and forged papers. There were guns disguised as pens, lipstick pistols, and several other disguised tools that looked like something straight out of a James Bond movie. But this was no movie, and the dangers were often imminent. But there's more. Back then, the official British Secret Intelligence Service SIS, now known as MI6, viewed the SOE with great suspicion. Sir Stuart Menzies, who was the head of the SIS at the time, often argued that the SOE agents were amateur, dangerous and bogus. Other military commanders also harbored special dislikes for this special unit. Bomber commanders, for example, resented having to loan their precious aircraft for SOE missions. But with Winston Churchill solidly behind them, the SOE not only survived, but flourished. Some remarkable agents who played major roles during the war, disrupting the order within enemy lines and leaking critical information to their home countries include Violette Zabo. Violette's French background made her a perfect candidate for the Special Operations Executive. In 1944, she parachuted into occupied France armed with her suitcase transmitter and fake papers, but was forced to return to Britain by plane after her cover was exposed by the Germans. But that's not the end of her story. During the D-Day landings, Violette parachuted into France on June 8, 1944, to assist with the resistance efforts in sabotaging German lines of communication. Her impressive feats include helping to delay the deployment of the 2nd SS Panzer Division to Normandy. Though her endeavors ended in capture and subsequent execution in February 1945, her bravery and dedication will forever be remembered. Other notable missions carried out by the SOE include the assassination of Reinhard Heydrich, the deputy chief of the Schutzstaffik in Czechoslovakia during 1942. Again in 1943, this special unit dealt a heavy blow on the Nazis' atomic bomb program by destroying the heavy water plant at Vimork in Norway. So you should know that this unit was nothing to mess with. But if you think they are badass, you should see what comes next. The Abwehr On the German side was the Abwehr, a military intelligence organization established in 1866, way before the emergence of Germany itself. The Abwehr was founded in order to gather intelligence for the Prussian government during a war with neighboring Austria. Following its profound success during the Franco-Prussian War in 1870, and the several exploits wrought by its agent during World War I, which included spying on the manufacture of poison gas in France, as well as tracking the production and shipping of munitions in Britain, the Abwehr was retired. The cessation of its operations was orchestrated by the Versailles Treaty. But then, a dramatic twist in history caused the re-emergence of this special unit. When World War II came calling, and the Nazis took control of Germany in the 1930s, the Abwehr arose from its grave to play its own part in the ensuing conflict. But this time, things would be done a little bit differently. Wilhelm Canaris, the new Abwehr director, divided the agency into three specialized branches, 
espionage, counter-espionage, and saboteurs. Canaris subsequently appointed agents who had proved themselves as heads of these three branches. But there's a controversial part to this selection. Each of the three individuals who were charged with leading the three branches of the special unit was required to not be a member of the Nazi party. As you would imagine, this aroused the suspicion of the rival security agency, and the two agencies came into conflict a couple of times. During World War II, the Abwehr played a pivotal role in manipulating the dynamics of the war. This included tracking troops and ammunition transports, infiltrating foreign intelligence and leaking sensitive documents, and intercepting radio messages. But that's not all. As a testament to the impressive efforts put in by the Abwehr, the agency was able to successfully place two operatives in the British intelligence agency for two years. These brave agents developed a highly successful encryption device known as the Enigma machine, and they were able to track and monitor various resistance movements in occupied Europe. Is your mind blown yet? We're just even beginning to scratch the surface. Stick with us so you won't miss the best part of this video. The United States Office of Strategic Services, you might know them as the CIA, an agency that's probably spying on you as you're watching this video. But during World War II, they went by a different name, the Office of Strategic Services, or OSS. This team of highly trained individuals, headed by William J. Donovan, known as Wild Bill, was formed at the brink of the Second World War for the purpose of obtaining information about enemy nations and sabotaging their military efforts. Let's just say they did their job extremely well and still remain one of the most revered intelligence agencies in history. During World War II, the agency boasted a staggering 12,000 agents, strategically placed in clandestine locations across enemy territories and sometimes even among friendlies. You can't trust anybody in war now, can you? These OSS agents were located in regions where the U.S. military forces were operating, including Nazi-occupied Europe and Berlin. Their mission was simple, carry out counter-propaganda and disinformation activities in order to turn the people against their own government, produce analytical reports for policymakers. And of course, the agents were also tasked with staging special sabotage operations behind enemy lines in order to support guerrilla and resistance fighters. After the war, many of these OSS agents went on to live normal lives, and some of them even became famous. A few of these brave agents, who you may probably know from their other preferred careers, include film director John Ford, chef and writer Julia Child, actor Sterling Hayden, and even famous baseball player Moore Berg. Tools and Techniques of World War II Espionage You would agree that being a spy is a really dangerous job, especially for a female. Therefore, it was essential that these brave women be armed with advanced gadgets and tools that will make their job a bit less dangerous. You may not find 007 disappearing cars or ejector seats here, but these gadgets are pretty cool for their time. Check out some of them. Black Joe Sinking enemy ships during World War II was a huge achievement. Back in the day, this simple gadget known as Black Joe or Coal Torpedoes played a huge part in these operations. Designed by Thomas Edgeworth Courtenay of the Confederate Secret Service, Black Joe featured a hollow iron casing made to look like a lump of coal. Inside this coal was an explosive powerful enough to destroy a steam engine. The idea was to shovel the Black Joe, perfectly hidden in the coal supply, into the firebox of Union steam transportation ships, where it would explode. British double agent Eddie Chapman, known as Agent Zigzag, was once given one of these coals to sabotage the merchant ship city of Lancaster in order to obtain an example of the German bomb. Gills for Underwater Breathing Imagine you were a spy in Milan during World War II with a mission to creep into a secured military facility. Unfortunately, the only way in is to stay underwater for a prolonged time. Surely no one can successfully hold her breath for so long. Don't fret because we've you covered. This underwater breathing apparatus was developed in 1939 by Christian J. Lambertson. Although it was initially rejected by the U.S. Navy, the OSS showed great interest and it became part of the cool gadgets used by the OSS agents on their clandestine missions. Other Gadgets 
Many other cool inventions that were used by the special agents during World War II include cigarettes that had been laced with tetrahydrocannabinol acetate, or Indian hemp. This was used as a non-lethal incapacitating agent during the Edgewood Arsenal experiments. This special cigarette was especially effective during interrogations, as it often brought out uncontrollable chattiness. Then there were the knives perfectly concealed within shoes, tapes, coins, and pencils. These agents also used cigarette cases that would explode upon opening and suicide pills hidden in necklaces or rings in the unfortunate case that the agent was captured. Now it's time for today's subscriber pick. Before we go on with the video, check out today's subscribers pick. During World War II, a conflict that was marred with injustice and several cases of human rights violations, captured female spies often endured the worst treatment in captivity. From sexual molestations by male officers to inhumane treatments and intense torture, these courageous women face the worst of conditions in the line of duty. Drop a comment to pay your respect to these unsung heroes who risked everything to infiltrate enemy lines and ultimately alter the course of the war. Now, let's get on with the video. Now that we're done with the history and juicy details of espionage during World War II, let us begin our journey into the lives of the courageous women who risked life and limb to cross into enemy territories as spies during the Second World War. Vera Atkins, the greatest SOE agent in history. We begin with one of the most iconic names in World War II espionage history, an enigmatic SOE agent by the name of Vera Atkins. Born in 1908 in Romania, Vera Maria Rosenberg moved to London in 1933, where she adopted her mother's maiden name. Her career in the espionage world began in early 1941 as a secretary in the F section. This special arm was responsible for many SOE activities in Nazi-occupied France. Gradually, she rose in rank, becoming the top officer responsible for the housekeeping related to each SOE agent. Do you want to hear a fun fact? You've probably seen the James Bond series, so surely you must be familiar with one of the most iconic characters of the Ian Fleming series, Miss Moneypenny. It is believed that Atkins was the inspiration behind the creation of this character, who was also the secretary to the secret intelligence services in the series. In an oral testimony documented in Sarah Helm's 2008 book Forgotten Voices of the Secret War, an inside history of special operations. During the Second World War, Vera Atkins famously said, I've always found personally that being a woman has great advantages if you know how to play the thing right, and I believe that all the girls, the women who went out, had the same feeling. But there's a twist to the story of this courageous woman. An unfortunate event in 1943 almost put a blemish on her career. At the time, SOE agents were trained to transmit encoded messages back to London. But in 1943, there were indications that the message had been intercepted by enemy forces, and the Germans had started sending transmissions under the guise of the agents they had captured. Unfortunately, the intelligence services at Baker Street missed these signals, leading to the capture and killing of 27 agents, including the iconic Noor Inayat Khan. Although there have been many speculations regarding the negligence on Atkins's part that resulted in the unfortunate loss of valuable men and women, this fault cannot be attributed to one individual. Following the liberation of France and the dissolution of the SOE, Vera Atkins intensified her efforts to search for the missing SOE personnel. Unfortunately, of the 118 agents who were lost with no traces, 117 had been killed. But then, this superwoman was able to successfully trace all the 117 agents and brought their killers to war crime trials. In 1948, Atkins was awarded the Croix de Guerre and appointed a CBE in 1997. Virginia Hall, the most dangerous Allied spy. Another member of the World War II Secret Service Hall of Fame is Virginia Hall, an enigmatic figure whose courageous strides earned her a place among the greats. Her journey into the world of espionage began on a sour note. After applying to serve in the United States Foreign Service in an embassy post in Turkey, her application was rejected. Why? Because she had a prosthetic leg, a result of a hunting accident. But many believe it was because she was a woman. Undaunted by the rejection, Hall moved to France, where she worked as an ambulance driver. Unfortunately, she had to flee when France surrendered to Germany, and the war took a dramatic turn. 
Upon her arrival in the United Kingdom, she was surprised to be asked to provide intelligence from her time in France. This reignited the passion for espionage in this brave lady. She was subsequently recruited by Vera Atkins and sent into Lyon under the cover of a stringer for the New York Post. You should know that this was the first time a female SOE agent would be sent into France, so it was a really big deal. This was the moment Virginia Hall had been waiting for, and she surely didn't fail in her mission. Hall was able to successfully smuggle out not just sensitive information, but also prisoners of war. She also helped smuggle in agents and supplies into Nazi-controlled French territories. Her notoriety brought her instant fame, and she soon became highly wanted. Posters seeking La Dame qui boite, or the lady with a limp, were pasted all around the city, as news of Hall's exploits spread far and wide. Klaus Barbie, famously known as the Butcher of Lion, reportedly said, I would give anything to lay my hands on that bit asterisk H, so you know she definitely did her job well. The situation grew more and more dangerous for Hall, and when it was apparent that she had to leave, Hall fled France via the Pyrenees. Now, here's the crazy part. Virginia Hall escaped from France on foot in the dead of winter, Keeping in mind that this was a woman with a prosthetic leg, how absolutely insane is that? Once she was back in Britain, she quickly enlisted in the OSS and was sent back into France as an old peasant woman with gray hair. Her cover this time around was a radio presenter. This second mission was also a huge success, as she was able to monitor German intelligence and organize drops of supplies to over 1,500 Maquis fighters, to be used in sabotage attacks against the rail lines, bridges, and tunnels used by the Germans. Historians believe that her efforts, like other women who functioned as spies during the war, hastened Germany's surrender, which signaled the end of World War II. On July 8, 1982, Virginia Hall died of natural causes at the ripe age of 76. At the time, she had retired and was living on a farm with her husband, Paul Guayot. Thus ended the story of this remarkable woman. Some heroes don't wear capes now, do they? Nor Inayat Khan, the Indian princess who became a spy. When you think of Indian royals, you may probably imagine them as spoiled brats, walking around in their fancy gowns while being doted on by their faithful servants. But this Indian princess broke every stereotype in the book. Born in Moscow in 1914, Noor Inayat Khan had a colorful life from the very beginning. Her father, Inayat Khan, a famous Sufi teacher, was a descendant of a noble Indian Muslim family, and her mother was Parani Amina Begum. But things took a dramatic turn. When World War I came knocking and the entire family, including her three brothers, had to move to London. But that wasn't the end of their journey. The family later moved to Paris, where Noor spent the bulk of her formative years. Before delving into the world of espionage, Noor was a published children's author, and she enjoyed music as well as she enjoyed writing. Soon it was time to move again, as the family had to flee to Britain when war broke out in 1939. Although most of her family were pacifists, Noor chose a different path. Her desire to participate in the war efforts informed her decision to join the Women's Auxiliary Air Force. But this was not just to gain glory for herself, but for the entire Indian people. In her interview, Noor stated that she hoped her participation might act as a bridge for mutual understanding between Britain and India. Noor's glorious moment came in late 1942, when her exceptional skill at operating the radio brought her to the attention of the SOE, where she was subsequently recruited. With Vera Atkins solidly behind her, Noor Inayat Khan became the first female radio operator to be sent into Nazi-occupied France from the United Kingdom, under the codename Madeleine. Her fluency in French, as well as her familiarity with Paris, made her a candidate of choice, and she did her job well. While in France, Noor was able to aid the delivery of arms and explosives to the resistance network, among many other monumental achievements. Unfortunately, her cover was blown on October 1943, just a few months after she had arrived in France. Noor was betrayed and arrested in her Paris flat from where she was taken to the German security headquarters. Not to be outdone by the Germans, Noor Inayat Khan made two daring escape attempts, but she failed. Ultimately, they had to put her in solitary confinement, with shackles on her hands and feet to stop her from escaping. 
The end came in September 1944, when she, along with three other female SOE agents, were transferred to the German concentration camp at Dachau, where they were executed. Now here's the interesting part. Even though Noor faced grueling torture and was ruthlessly interrogated, she never revealed any information or intelligence, and her final words at the time of her execution was, Liberté. Following her death, Noor Inayat Khan was awarded a George Cross and a Croix de Guerre. In 2012, a statue was erected in her memory near her childhood home in London, and her family's home received an English Heritage Blue plaque in August 2020. Christina Scarbeck, Churchill's favorite spy. You might know her as Christine Granville, or by many of her exploits as a super spy for the British Special Operations Executive during World War II. Born in May 1908 to a Polish aristocratic father by the name of Count Jerzy Skarbek and Stephanie Goldfelder, his Jewish wife, Maria Christina Janina Skarbek, was born into the wealthy upper class, but fate altered her journey. From a very young age, her father taught her to ride horses and use guns. This unique upbringing played a huge role in her success as a spy. Christina earned a reputation for her charming looks, earning her the title of Britain's most glamorous spy. Upon the invasion of Poland by Nazi Germany, Christina, who was in Ethiopia with her husband Jerzy Gizicki, who was a diplomat, returned to London to offer her services as a spy. This was unusual at the time, as all the other members of the Secret Service were recruited by the agency. Here's where things get a little interesting. In order to showcase her interest in espionage, Christina organized a meeting with George Taylor, who was the head of MI6 at the time, in an attempt to convince him of her usefulness and divulge a plan she had concocted in her head. Whether due to her charm or the ingenuity of her plans, Christina Scarbeck became the first female MI6 spy. Christina was able to infiltrate the Polish border, where she located her mother, whose life was under threat due to the fact that she was a Jewish aristocrat. Sadly, her resistance eventually led to her unexplainable disappearance. In 1939, Christina also made several important trips, including skiing along the Polish-Hungarian border while bringing back critical intelligence, weaponry, people, and people who were stuck in the war-torn region. Christina Skarbek was also able to assemble important information and obtain several photographs of German troops on the Soviet Union border. Unfortunately, she was captured in January 1949, alongside Andrzej Kowerski, a Polish war hero, with whom she had an affair. Two days after their capture, Christina had a bright idea, which she believed would be their way out of the precarious situation. She decided to bite her tongue till she began to produce blood from her mouth. This was an indication that she was suffering from tuberculosis, and both were released due to the contagious nature of the disease. The two were then subsequently smuggled out of Hungary into Yugoslavia, and then hiding in the boots of two cars, the pair was able to flee Europe and made it safely to the SOE headquarters in Egypt. Her remarkable work for the British intelligence network, especially her prediction of the German invasion of the Soviet Union, which eventually came true, prompted Winston Churchill's famous remark that Christina was his favorite spy. Christina's exceptional bravery and composure in the face of danger made her a force to reckon with, imprinting her name in the sands of time as one of the greatest spies to ever live. Honorable Mentions Other remarkable women who made their marks for their country by sneaking into enemy territories to obtain crucial information that altered the course of the Second World War include Amy Thorpe, Barbara Lowers, Josephine Baker, Nancy Wake, and Josefina Guerrero, to mention a few. Today we remember their sacrifices, and we salute them for their bravery. Though their efforts are often swept under the carpet, and most of them sadly met their end in the line of duty, their efforts in the war will always be remembered throughout history. Thank you for watching this video. See you in the next one. Next.